Alright, so it's about 8.08 here on my clock. I'm going to go ahead and get uh, get started here. So again, as the title card suggests, everybody, we're just going to sit down and we're going to push around some uh, push, push, push around some pixels, so to speak, in Valorant Victory uh, Vietnam. We're basically, we're going to build a quick map sheet for um, an upcoming Valorant Victory game that is planned for myself and Gianna. Um, in the Central Highlands of Vietnam, probably 1967-1968. So, get that out of the way. Um, for pretty much anything that you build in Photoshop, uh, it's always a good idea to save everything you can in some sort of a template, build up your assets. Uh, like, I got all these buildings down here that I've just basically been slowly building up and using. And what this pretty much does is... Uh, over time, what you do is you build up this great library of assets, and eventually you'll be able to just pretty you know, plug and play, uh, so to speak. You'll just you literally just Lego block together uh, map sheets, and um, you know, that way each game can have its own map sheet. So here we go with some uh, again with a, with a template that I've got built up for um, Valor and Victory maps. Again, the hex grid's already built. Um, it's already numbered in the same format that uh, is standard for the Valorant Victory rule set. So these hexes are numbered obviously by rows and columns, um, and they're numbered in the format and in the in the uh, methodology or whatever that is standard for the uh, the Valorant Victory system. What I always try and do is design my maps so that when I can you know upload it either on, on tabletop or who knows where, a board game geek. There is a huge Valorant Victory community over on Board Game Geek. So when I start to upload these on Board Game Geek, you know people will be able to download it and use it with their uh, with their with, with their counters. So what you would do is you just download this. We uh, probably create it as a PDF. You download it, you print it, you mount it on some cardstock. Uh, boom! You've got uh, you've got map sheets, and they're the right size, they're the right shape, uh, they're the right numbering system, where it will play nicely with all your Valorant Victory pieces, all your Valorant Victory boards, etc. We're going to try and build a table that we can use uh, with Gianna with the game that we have on the books uh, for later on this weekend. So what she specifically requested was, you know, Valorant Victory, Vietnam, and uh, something near the Laotian border. So we're talking about the Central Highlands. Uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and tuck these... I don't think I'm going to need them for this. I don't think there's too many rice paddies in the Central Highlands. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get rid of most of these hills. In fact, you know what? I'm going to get rid of all these hills. I've got everything saved, guys, so it's all good. I'm pretty much just trying to get down to a base map sheet. Anyway, we're going for three court. We're going for the Central Highlands because that's kind of what was requested. It's far away from the coast. It's right up against the Laotian border. And what American forces would do here, American and South Vietnamese forces would do here, uh, mostly American Army and South Vietnamese Army. Not a lot of Marine Corps, no Australians, no, you know, those are the two main, you know, factions that we see in, in Three Corps. Uh, what they're trying to do is close off the border to uh, entry points from the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is pending, passing south through Laos. American and Allied forces are, of course, not allowed to go into Laos. Um, so the... Um, the North Vietnamese Army and the National Liberation Front, otherwise known as the Viet Cong, are allowed to move supplies and troops and everything else pretty much with impunity south through Laos, and then they, you know, turn um, east out of Laos into South Vietnam wherever they want. Uh, American and South Vietnamese forces are not allowed to go into Laos, but they can try to interdict this stuff at the border, and that's kind of what we're going to be doing. So, again, we're in the Central Highlands, near the border, so we're talking about a lot of um, hills. A lot of mountains. Hamburger Hill is literally in this area. Hill, oh god, I can't remember the name of the hill. Um, well, that's the name of the hill, but the number of hill, that was like 983 or something. Hills were usually in Vietnam named for, they're not just random numbers, they're not serial numbers, they're usually named for their height and feet. So when you hill, when you see something in a movie that says, you know, we're, we're heading up to hill 582, the hill is 582 feet tall, it is the general convention to that. Alrighty, so, um, again, we have a hill uh, the, over here in Photoshop. We have all of our layers. And um, we're going 
to build some hills first, like I said. So I got my hill layer selected down here to the uh, to the lower right, and we're going to build some hills. So here we go. I'm going to use my eyedropper tool. I'm going to select my sample layer. That's you know kind of where I have the, the color saved, along with some of its uh, some of its effects. In this case, drop shadow. So I've got my color saved, and I'm going to select my brush. Just a normal brush, please. Nothing fancy yet. We'll get to fancy brushes in a little bit. And what this should allow me to do now is to pretty much just draw a hill. So let me test this. Yeah, okay, there we go. Now it's working. Okay. So hopefully if you guys can see this on the stream, what I'm doing here is I'm getting different widths, different weights of... Uh, you can't do this with a mouse pad. I'm getting different weights uh, of thickness with my line. And this is really going to be important when I go to draw tree lines, and when I want to draw streams, and when I want to draw um, uh, tree lines, streams, and roads. I mean, for hills, it's going to help too, but... Um, it's really going to be important for these other things. Okay, so now that we're back in business, again, we're going to be doing a lot of hills. You want to be very clear when you're drawing your map board to um, make it very clear where the center dot of the hex is. You'll notice every um, hex on the map board has a dot in its center. There's a very specific reason for that. It shows the exact geometric center of the hex. This is a little bit bigger. My brush a little bit bigger. It shows the exact center of the hex, and it shows for rules purposes um, what kind of terrain is in the hex. Like right here, that's not going to work. So, uh, Mr. Skobek, are you doing any more 3D printing lately, or uh, have you had enough uh, shaming us with your uh, 3D printed 28 millimeter leopards? Because that thing was awesome. So is that like, yep, I've seen, there's another screw up on my part. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is draw a lot of hills, and what these hills are going to do, I'm leaving at least one full hex between each hill. That way um, we have a, um, a little valley. Um, this is a, a game with Gianna uh, later on the weekend, or later on in the week, I should say, or during the weekend. And what we're going to be aiming at here, because, you know, obviously Gianna's going to be one of our players, I want to include a lot of helicopters. And with helicopters, a good thing to do is to uh, have uneven ground. It makes it interesting to fly the helicopter through valleys. She'll be able to use terrain to screen her movement. Uh, I'm assuming she's going to want to play the Americans. Meanwhile, I'll be able to use uh, the terrain to screen my troops and my gun positions uh, from her helicopters. Because normally helicopters can just, because they're flying, obviously they, can, they automatically have elevation. They can see, I'm going to try and do this a faster way. They can automatically see every, there we go. They can automatically see everything on the table. Depending on the um, altitude of the helicopters, they may not be able to see through um, elevation. And again, it's like kind of a half dozen in one uh, hand, uh, six in the other, as far as, you know, risk reward. And this is going to be up to her as the helicopter commander. Um, what kind of altitude she wants to be at. Uh, one common solution is to keep your troop ships, like your Hueys, your Slicks, to keep them low and slow, to use the terrain to, to uh, you know, protect them, because, again, they're, they're carrying squads of infantry, and uh, things can get very nasty very quickly when you start taking ground fire with, you know, troop ships loaded up with, uh, loaded up with uh, infantry. One of those goes down, you not only lose the bird, you lose the whole... Uh, You not only lose the bird, you lose the whole, you know, the whole squad that was in the slick. But on the other hand, her gunships, either AH-1 or UH-1H gunships, 
are going to be uh, probably flying higher. They're armored, they get a little tougher, they can take a little bit more ground fire, and quite frankly, taking ground fire is their job. You know, they are, they are gunships. Um, even if they don't hit or kill or suppress any uh, NVA or Viet Cong units, um, every NVA or Viet Cong weapon that's firing at them, the helicopter is doing its job, because you know what, that's one that's gun shooting at troop ships. But then again, you know, you're also getting shot at <laughs> by people who don't like you very much. It's bad for your self-esteem. some trucks for battle group um you had your first game oh you had your first game of battle group last week it was a disaster without anyone having trucks for supplies uh okay um trucks in battle group i always have trucks in almost any game i have played some games where one side or the other did not have trucks and um Again, the games I play tend to be a little bit larger scale and, uh, what's the word, uh, emphasize realism a little bit, perhaps more than just like, you know, beer and pretzels kind of, you know, fun or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, trucks are extremely important in almost any tactical war game. For every tank, you need three trucks. Um, I'm not going to have any trucks in this game. We're, we're going to have it instead as helicopters, which, from a military standpoint, is almost like, you know, flying trucks. You need to be able to transport troops and supplies around. So this is more hills than you are apt to see in a lot of, uh, a lot of Valorant Victory games, but again, we're in the Central Highlands. We're in a mountainous part of Vietnam. In fact, what I'm going to do here super fast is I'm going to go ahead and select a batch of my hill. I'm going to copy and paste. So now I have a second level of hills. You'll see here it looks very bizarre, but that's no worries. I take my original hill, I copy the layer style, I get my new hill, my level 2 hill, so to speak. I paste the layer style, and now I have a level 2 hill. Uh, level 2 hills obviously aren't going to be nearly as extensive, but I'm just going to quickly... Oh no! Sorry, everybody, give me a second to fix Photoshop. Come on, Photoshop, don't embarrass me in front of my friends. There we go. symmetrical or too, uh, too even. Um, in the northern, in the more northerly parts of uh, South Vietnam, especially in um, 1967 into 68, um, the late 67 into early 68 during the build-up for Tet, um, they actually called it the hill fights. Uh, you had, um, the American Marines and uh, certain elements of the U.S. Army, um, especially in I Corps sector. In Third Corps sector, you got more Army units than Marine units, but Marines were a lot heavier in uh, the northernmost section, the DMZ, up in I Corps or First Corps. Uh, but in any event, you've got a lot of very, very high ground, a lot of hills, and um, battle for the control of those hills was extremely important. Because everyone in Vietnam, or everyone who watches a Vietnam War movie, likes to talk about, and likes to watch, and likes to, you know, you know, likes to marvel about the airstrikes. But what really makes or breaks when it comes to support is artillery. Because you know what? An airstrike comes in and uh, makes a big mess for 
five minutes, and then it's done. And you have to wait 12 more hours for another airstrike to come in sometimes. Because that airstrike's usually coming in from Da Nang, or uh, Tansanone Airport down by Saigon, or even worse, one of the carrier battle groups out in the South China Sea. Um, you know, so it might come in, it might miss, it might bomb your own guys by mistake, it might not want to bomb because your guys are too close. Who knows, weather can screw it up in those days. You know what never gets screwed up by, by weather? Artillery. Do you know what can bombard the, uh, the Viet Cong or the NBA for days at a time? You don't have to wait 12 hours for the next show? Artillery. You know what uh, is always going to be there? You know, rain, shine, night, day, doesn't matter, doesn't matter? Artillery. You know what's a lot closer to you in command because it's literally up at your battalion level or your regimental commander? Artillery. As opposed to an airstrike where you have to call another branch of the service. You have to call the Navy or the Air Force, probably. And that's, uh, that's never fun because you have to go way up to like a brigadier general. So airstrikes are fun. They're, they have a tremendous impact, but they, uh, they take a long time. They're not very reliable. But the, but the point of that whole story is uh, what really makes artillery work is elevation. You have to have the hills. You have to have the range, because if you're up high, your artillery can shoot further than the enemy's artillery. Artillery is always an indirect arcing weapon, and if, you, if your battery is situated on high ground, 800, 900, 1,000 feet higher than the enemy, and he's trying to shoot at you from up out of a valley, your artillery is not only going to be more accurate, but it's going to be able to actually outrange him. So while he's trying to set up his guns, drag him into position, you already have him under fire. And um, he's going to be out of gas. Alright, so here's my little scrap of, um, down here at the lower left, here's my little scrap of uh, river. So I'm going to super fast make that... Uh, fully visible, 100% uh, opacity so I can get a good sample with my eyedropper tool. Now that I have that, I'm going to knock that opacity back down to my 75. Um, it's a thing of preference. I just happen to like uh, things, I happen to like elements that are not full opacity. That way it doesn't look garish or, or stark when they layer on top of each other. Okay, I'm going to make my um, brush a little bit smaller. And again, as you can see here on my, go away, Mr. Machine. No, I don't want 30 pixels. Actually, I do want 30 pixels. All right, so if you can see over here on my layers, my layers have these effects that I have built into these layers. Um, I can do that with the uh, you know, layer menu up here, layer style, all these effects I can kind of stick in there with different settings. I won't go into all the details, but once I get a layer that I like for a certain element, in this case, rivers, I just kind of save it, and now anything that I draw in that layer is going to automatically um, come with that style cloned into it, no matter where I draw. So, to show you what I'm talking about, I'm going to start drawing some, uh, not so much rivers, but like little creeks. I'm going to go ahead and make that a little bit bigger. Here's where it's really important that your, uh, that your Wacom pad is behaving. Can you imagine trying to draw something organic like a river? Uh, with a mouse, where it's literally like, you know, click, you're drawing, click, you're not drawing, you know. It would not work. Well, it could technically work if you use your smudge tool and your eraser. I've done it, like, when the tool is legitimately broken, you're not completely crippled. But, um, damn, dude, it's, it's not easy. And it is a huge waste of time to try and do it. Uh, with with broken tools, so to speak. So you'll notice that as I'm drawing the river, the water always goes over the center dot uh, in the hex so that it's very clear this is a river hex and whatever rules the scenario stipulates for, um, for stream hexes or for river hexes uh, do apply in that hex. Whereas opposed to if you did something like this, here in Juliet 8, be like, is that a river hex or not? Because it's not over the dot. Anything that's, you know, the dot rules the hex. Whatever, whatever's in the dot, uh, like, there you go, designates what that hex is all about. And you certainly don't want to have your streams going up a hill or anything silly like that, so you have to kind of pay attention. 
attention to your topography. I think enough. You don't want to overdo it. Again, this is the highlands uh, inland uh, from the coast of uh, South Vietnam, so you don't want to get. Uh, there's not a whole lot of water up here. It's not. Uh, it's not like holy crap, man. Uh, down in the uh, Mekong Delta, you'd be drawing nothing but water. Okay. So now that that's done, I'm going to put in uh, some uh, just a couple of uh, small. Um, I don't want to say roads but almost like uh, trails. So again, referring to my layer menu, or my layer listing here, here in my layers window, uh, you can obviously, you know, name your layers however you want. Uh, some people think it's tedious, like you'll see a lot of people's uh, Photoshop files where it's just, you know, layer one, layer two, layer 703. I mean, I've seen some Photoshop files with a thousand layers in it. Um, I actually work with Photoshop on a professional level, um, or as a, as a professional, I, I do it like literally for work sometimes. I have to send this stuff off to other people, um, who also have Photoshop and they have to take it, they have to either rasterize it or turn it into some sort of an AVI, not AVI file, um, a vector file. There's all kinds of stuff they have to do with it. Whenever you're sending, whenever you're working seriously with Photoshop on a, either professional or semi-professional basis and you have to send that Photoshop file to somebody else, it's just polite to label your, your layers so that the next person knows what the hell you're doing. Um, if they have to, you know, if they want to uh, update something, they know what to do. They know what, they don't have to click on every layer and wait for it to, you know, pop up with, a, you know, with the selection box so they know what it is they're working with. Um, so it seems like, um, you know, what's the word? Uh, like, like I might be being a little bit anal. Um, <laughs> uh, I would never, uh, you know, deny that charge. Um, perfection is underrated uh, in a lot of t in a lot of cases. Um, but even if you're not sending it off to somebody else, l naming your layers can be a, a real big help because um, you can put information in there. Like right here with roads. What's the point of the whole story? Roads 170, 135, 180. That's the RGB code. Uh, for the color that I like to use in my roads. So now when I go to add to my roads, here's my little road scrap, um, my road scrap uh, layer. Um, but what color do I make the road? Well, I can go ahead in my color picker, men color picker menu and type in my RGB code 170 by 135 by 100. And I have the exact shade of uh, kind of a reddish brown, like 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 a reddish muddy brown, um, that I like to use for my uh, that I like to use for my uh, for my roads. Same in programming for people who uh, who don't who don't yeah who, oh who don't comment their code yeah you never know what the hell's going on I don't code. Um, I often uh, joke that I can't spell, you know, CSS, even though I just did. <laughs> I can't spell SQL. Uh, yeah, well, SQL's more of a database thing, but yeah, it's, coding is not not my jam. I look at a page of code, I'm like, oh my god, you are a much stronger person than I am. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and pick out a nice size for our roads here and see how that works. So you can see where, let me zoom in a little bit. You can see where there's a pattern inside, you know, wherever I draw. Actually, there's, I think there's like three effects here. I have an outer glow, that's the, uh, that's this very noisy kind of stubbly, uh, I'm trying to get like kind of a, kind of a rocky or, or muddy, slotchy effect here. Um, on the outside of the, uh, outside of my layer, then I have pattern overlay. That's the uh, the kind of rocky brown and lighter brown that I have deep on the inside of uh, wherever I draw the road at. And then I have um, stroke. Stroke is the very narrow brown. Let me zoom in a little bit more. Is the 
very narrow brown line that is between the internal part and the external part. So now that I'm super zoomed in, you can kind of see there's a little bit of a rock pattern on the inside of my road. I'm just trying to draw like a muddy um, jungle trail, so to speak. And rather than having to texturize all that by hand, again, you click around with the layers until you get the way you like it, you get the effects into your layer. Um, in this case, I have outer glow, pattern overlay, and stroke. You blend it together until you get the exact colors and densities and um, jitters. That's how much the machine will um, kind of fluctuate the patterns for you. Uh, there's like a hot photo. One thing Photoshop gives you is choices. It like chokes you to death on choices until you don't know what the hell you're doing. Um, but it gives you choices. And once you get the choices the way you like them, that's when you save the layer with that style of, um, not that style, I should say, with those effects, and you can copy paste that later on. So now, a long story, of the, the, long, the short version of that story is that I can draw whatever I want, and it's going to come with that, you know, style. Uh, here he is, whoa, you know, give him some eyelashes because he's, you know, super sexy. You know, it's, it's going to come with that layer, and that layer is going to be cloned onto whatever it is that you draw. Wherever you put pixels into that layer, it's going to bring those layer style choices that you made with it. Needless to say, we're not going to keep that, because that's not quite Vietnam themed. At least not the Central Highlands. And we're going to get uh, back to seriousness, and we're going to draw some... Uh, Some, uh, some more jungle trails. Unlike rivers, um, trails don't necessarily have to uh, follow low ground, but it helps. I don't want to draw too many. You, see, you can see how fast this is, guys. Um, I don't want to put in too many trails. Because, uh, again, this is the uh, Central Highlands where there's you know, not a whole lot of development. That's good. That'll work. Okay, now how about buildings? These buildings are my Vietnamese-style hooches that I have uh, kind of collected. This was kind of a... Um, this, this, the previous map that I, that I kind of based this template off of was a game I played with LSR 2590. Um, he is uh, from Australia, and he was asking for a game, um, obviously, that uh, featured Australian units. Well, Australian units in Vietnam were pretty much only in one part of one uh, province that was much more heavily developed uh, than this. Um, it was not right outside, but pretty close to, you know, it was definitely nearby uh, Saigon. A little bit further to the, uh, well, let me think here, a little bit further to the southeast of uh, Saigon, near the coast. A lot of uh, rubber plantations. So that's why this map uh, previously had so many buildings on it. I don't think I will have that many buildings on this map. Maybe a few. But not as many as we had previously. That's why I'm removing most of the buildings on this map. Hmm, that'll work. So, uh, do you do programming in your? Uh, let's go back. Do you do programming in your real life, or your other life, or whatever it is you want to call it, your non-gaming life, or do you work with programmers? Uh, I don't work with any programmer. I'm not a programmer, like I said. Sometimes I work with them because I do some web design. Um, not web development. And I have the feeling that you uh, know the difference between those two terms. <laughs> I am the clown who gets to draw all the pretty pictures, and then it's up to the web developer to actually make it work in a website. And um, very often the web developer does not like me very much, the web designer. Because, uh, although I try to be nice, I, I talk to the web developer ahead of time, and I'm like, you know, 
what what what, what formats do you want? Or what's the resolution that we're doing the website in, or whatever, you know? And I'll I'll, I'll work within whatever parameters he gives me, but. At the end of the day, I don't know how the hell any of the web stuff actually happens. I just literally make him assets and email him the assets. 